Hello there. I wanted to do a video just for Jehovah's Witnesses who visit my channel, who might be slowly waking up and realising that not everything Watchtower has told them is true. And I wanted to give 10 tips for um, kind of coping and, and making it through that uh, awakening process. Tip number one, the three R's, research, research, research. You really cannot do enough research when you're trying to undo the effects of years and years and years of indoctrination. You really need to educate yourself and inform yourself about precisely how you've been misled because otherwise, as I'm going to explain later in this video, it could be detrimental to you. So the best places to go to, in my experience, um, Obviously, I'm going to plug JW Survey because uh, it's my website and hopefully some of it is helpful. But you really ought to check out jwfacts.com. That was one of my first websites that I went to. And just the general tone of it is very um, non-threatening, very sincere. And it just basically focuses on the facts. You also really need to read, if you haven't already read it, Crisis of Conscience by former governing body member Ray Franz. Um, it's quite a thick book as you can see, uh, but you, if you're waking up from indoctrination, it's basically a must read because it was written by, uh, as I say, a former governing body member, and it goes into so much detail about the organization's history from the perspective of somebody who was able to see the organization from perspectives that are obviously denied to ordinary witnesses. He was sitting on the governing body when they were making key decisions that would affect millions of people. So I would really strongly recommend you to read this book. And if buying it is problematic for you for whatever reason, um, in hard copy, you can actually, there's a website called scribd.com where you can read it online in PDF format or download it. And I think you pay a small fee for downloading it. Um, when I did it, it was something like $5. I don't know what it is now. Um, but it's well worth downloading it and reading because it will give you a perspective on the organization that you won't find anywhere else. Tip number two, plan your exit strategy. Leaving behind a religion that you have held dear for years and years and years and all of the indoctrination that's gone along with that is not an easy process, especially when there are family members involved, perhaps people who you see on a day-to-day -day basis, witness friends, um, and it's very worthwhile sitting down and planning very carefully where you want to go with this, whether, you're, whether your objective is to become inactive, whether your objective is to disassociate yourself. These are decisions only you can make, but it's worthwhile thinking very carefully about what the ramifications will be. Tip number three, protect your privacy online. I can't stress this enough. The thing about the internet, especially social media, is that if you have witness friends and family, it's very, very easy for them to see what you're doing online, whether you're going on websites that uh, they would view as questionable. Even liking uh, a video or a meme or whatever that portrays the witnesses in a, in a less than flattering light can land you in trouble. And it's, so it's well worth thinking very, very carefully about how much your witness friends and family can see of you online. Especially if you're going to use Facebook, I would strongly recommend if you're a fader, that is you're, you're wanting to stay in active and not disassociate yourself and keep your bonds with your uh, family members, I would strongly recommend setting up a fake account on Facebook. Don't have anything on your Facebook account that give, could give a clue as to your real identity because that could land you in hot water. Tip number four, build a team. When I was inactive, I was inactive for maybe two years before I dis disassociated myself and I was shunned during that period even though technically I was still one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I call it preemptive shunning. And it's very, very difficult to go through that kind of ostracism, especially when there's no real reason for it. It's just um, people who you thought were friends turning their back on you because you're not uh, as, as zealous and devout as they are anymore. So what you really need to do is 
uh, establish a team. Maybe you have um, family members who aren't witnesses. Maybe you have friends at work or neighbours or people in your community that you can just draw that little bit closer to. Because when the shunning kicks in, whether you're, whether you're inactive or, or you're disassociated or disfellowshipped, when the shunning kicks in, it will be difficult and you'll need some kind of team. It's human nature to, to want to belong to a community. And it's important that you build that team now before things start to get more difficult. Tip number five, exercise extreme caution when talking with witness friends and family and especially elders uh, about your doubts. In fact, I would recommend not to talk about your doubts at all unless it's absolutely necessary. Maybe you've got a friend, a close friend who's an elder and you think, oh well, you know, Bill's such a, a close family friend and he's so open-minded and I've heard him say things before anyway. So I'm sure if I have him around for a coffee and let him know what I've found online, I'm sure he'll be understanding. No, it doesn't work that way. I was once Bill the elder. I was once a very open-minded elder and I can tell you that when you're an elder, you are essentially a line manager. It doesn't matter what your personal thoughts are, you do what the organization tells you to do. It's far better to avoid any conversation, especially with elders, and even when it comes to friends and family members. Be very careful with um, what information you let out because it could land you in a back room um, having a, a very serious conversation, perhaps even a judicial committee, because depending on how strict your local congregation is, um, any kind of doubting of the organisation, uh, well, it's just not allowed. You're not allowed to doubt the organisation. And I've sat in a room with elders, looked them in the eye and been told we're not allowed to discuss doctrine with you. It just isn't on the table for discussion. Related to this is tip number six, be realistic about your family. Just because you're waking up doesn't mean your husband or wife will wake up, doesn't mean your children will wake up. It takes a long time, it takes a variety of factors to bring someone to a situation where they're able to start honestly questioning their beliefs. It's not as easy as flicking a switch and if you expect it to be that easy, with your spouse, with your children, you will be bitterly disappointed. It's far better to be patient. Obviously, depending on how close you are, you will want to say something. You'll maybe want to prepare them for the fact that you'll, you're uh, winding down, going on the ministry and going to the meetings and that kind of thing. That's perfectly understandable. But just don't uh, expect them to drop everything and follow you or to agree with you. Just share small nuggets of information that you found, especially in the uh, publications, because you can't expect them to trust anything you find on JW Facts or JW Survey. But if you find something in the publications themselves that doesn't make sense, then just just mention it, but don't kind of make a big deal of it. When I was waking my wife up, that's precisely what I did. I'd share things now and then, but I wouldn't insist that she saw things my way. And by and large, I left her to come to me with questions. And eventually she ended up joining me, but it doesn't work out that way with all wives or husbands. It really isn't as simple as just expecting your loved ones to wake up. So you really do need to be realistic in that regard. Tip number seven, get support. Uh, I can't stress enough how life-changing the awakening process can be. If you've been a, Jeho a Jehovah's Witness for any significant amount of time, it will have had an enormous impact on you psychologically. And this can lead to all sorts of psychological issues. And if it's at all possible for you or within your means, in some countries the state provides this, um, but it would be adv advisable for you to seek out a therapist and some kind of professional help to guide you through the issues that you're having to deal with. If for any reason you can't uh, get a therapist, um, try, and, try and at least avail yourself of the um, resources that are available to you online. There's an excellent Facebook group um, called Ex Jehovah's Witness Recovery Group 3 with over 5,000 members where you can share your story and at least have some sense of community, some sense of 
um, people understanding what you're going through or what you've been through and who can offer advice. That's just one example. There are other communities as well where people who have been through this situation themselves can give you some kind of support. And believe me, when you've been through such an, an, an unbelievable thing as, as being in a cult for years and years, um, you really do need as much support as you can get. Tip number eight, take your time and don't be rushed. If you're waking up from your indoctrination as a Jehovah's Witness, this itself is a huge accomplishment and you still have um, potentially a lot of heartache ahead of you, but it's important that you go through all of this at your own pace and don't let anyone tell you, oh, well, you know, you need to believe this or you need to believe that, you need to join such and such a church. It's up to you to make those decisions yourself when you're ready for it and according to the conclusions that you arrive at because everybody's different. Don't let anybody tell you what you, what you should believe or at what stage you should be at in your awakening process. Tip number nine, don't expect all XJWs to be friend material. I know this sounds rather obvious and possibly quite contentious, but the simple truth is that just because someone else has been through your experience, they too have awakened from uh, Jehovah's Witness indoctrination. That alone doesn't make them um, worthy of being a lifelong friend. It just simply doesn't work that way. I'm not saying that there aren't some wonderful people in the XJW community, because obviously there are. I've got many friends within the XJW community who have gone through the same experience as me. But sharing my experience shouldn't be the only thing that qualifies somebody as your friend. It should be a variety of other factors as well. So please be a little bit careful when it comes to choosing who your friends are from among the XJW community because although there are a lot of wonderful people out there and you're going to really enjoy getting to know them, it just simply isn't true that if somebody is an XJW then automatically they must be your friend. It just doesn't work that way. And finally, tip number 10, expect to have doubts and flashbacks. Going through years and years of indoctrination of an organisation telling you who your friend should be, how you should behave, etc, etc, micromanaging every area of your life. To go from that to being free to do whatever you like basically, to pursue your authentic self, that's no small thing and it's perfectly understandable that you will have times when you doubt what doubt the decision you've made, you start asking yourself, am I really right to do this? Surely there must be some truth to what I was doing. Maybe the governing body are God's organisation on earth after all. Perhaps I've missed something. Perhaps I've been misled, etc, etc. And all of this is simply a product of the indoctrination that you went through because you cannot be indoctrinated for decades and not have it have some kind of residue on your psyche. I go through the same thing from time to time and frankly I regard it as a healthy thing to still have doubts. It's healthy to continue to question yourself because the moment you get to a stage in life where you think you've got everything figured out, you think you've got all the answers, that's when you need to start worrying. So it's perfectly healthy to have doubts but don't feel as though you're regressing or you're somehow not worthy or don't feel any guilt basically if you do have flashbacks to when you are a witness or doubts about whether you're pursuing the right course. It's perfectly normal to have those doubts. Part of the reason why I mentioned research, research, research at the beginning of the video is so that when those doubts occur, you can fall back on what you've learned. You can think, hang on, what did I read in Crisis of Conscience? What have I learned about the Mexico Malawi scandal, about the UN scandal? What have I learned about child abuse? And then when you connect all of those dots, sometimes you need to do it many, many times in your life. But when you refresh what you've learned, what has been proven to you by documented evidence about the organisation, that's what helps you to move past those momentary periods of, of doubt and of feeling as though somehow you might have made a mistake. It's perfectly normal. So those are my 10 tips for leaving Jehovah's Witnesses. I hope some or all of them are useful to you and thank you so much for watching.